how long have you been practicing uh, martial arts? Um, about 50 years. Yeah, nice. since I was a little kid. Yeah. So you started in the U.S., right? Yeah, I started, I was probably, I want to say 10 or 11 when I first started martial arts. So I did, uh, I practiced Kung Fu Sun Tzu for 12 years. So it's kind of, Kung Fu Sun Tzu is kind of a toilet foot based style. It's on the West Coast mostly. And uh, it's mostly like self-defense fighting stuff, you know, kind of low on forms and all that stuff. It was all about kind of practical self-defense skills and all. So I, I did that for 12 years. And uh, then when I was, after college, I was, I guess, 23, I went to Taiwan. And then I, you know, I was in Taiwan 11 years training. I did, uh, you know, the internal styles and the sandan and all that. And then I came back here, I, I think I was 34 or 33 or four. And I started Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu then. And then I just, you know, that was like the next avenue of all what, of that. What made you get into BJJ? You know, so my whole focus, my whole life was kind of on self-defense or, you know, fighting skills. And I wrestled a little bit, you know, when I was younger, but um, there's no real ground fighting in Chinese martial arts. I mean, you'll hear about, oh, so-and-so has a secret. They don't. I mean, there's some rudimentary pinning and like the monkey style I've seen. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a um, ground boxing style in, in Southern Shaolin, right? And it's kind of cool, but it's kind of like a defensive guard. You know, you get knocked down. How do you trip the guy or scissor his leg, but there's not really wrestling on the ground, right? And I knew from um, a couple bad fights I'd been in, uh, you can end up on the ground a fair amount of the time. Right. So I first saw the Gracie in action tape. I was back doing a seminar. Like, it, this is a couple years before the UFC. And I was like, this is, you know, I, I mean, I knew about judo and all that, but, you know, it seemed in my mind very just sportive, which is not bad. So when I saw the Gracie stuff, I was like, wow, these guys are using like this old school judo to really uh, fight, right? And then the next year I came back, I had a friend that had started training. So I went to train and then, you know, that's how I, I first started. And then when I moved back, I just got right into it. And then, you know, at first I was like, I'll train a few years and, you know, have some, some, I guess, sufficient ground fight skills. And then I got into it because I could, started competing all the time. It was another avenue of co competition. You know, after 30, you know, you don't want to hit in the head anymore, you know, right. yeah. yeah, kind of thing. So, or like with push hands, you know, you could do something where, you have real resistance as martial, but it's not full on kickboxing or MMA. Right. So it's some amateur MMA stuff early on. And then I just grappled and then there no gi grappling got big. Um, you know, I kept doing it and then I did, I did pretty well. And then I went pro in my mid forties. Nice. I was a grappler, but I, for a couple of years, but the conditioning at that age, everyone was like literally less than half my age. So I did okay, but it was like, after a couple of years of it, it, it just turned out, you know, it's like so hard to stay at that level of conditioning, you know. And then, then the last few years, I started to compete in sumo a little bit. And that was the oh, last wow. time. I did see a picture of you in like a sumo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's an interesting story. I, I was always, a, dude, when I was a little kid, me and my dad on one of the public access TV stations, we had one week they'd have Thai boxing from Thailand and then they'd have sumo from Japan, right? And I used to watch it way before I did martial arts. So I always liked sumo. And then... I was, my first academy when I came back from the States, um, a guy showed up one day, American guy, and uh, he was a sumo, he'd done judo his whole life, he, he did sumo, and I was like, there's sumo here? And so there is. So anyway, um, I let him come and use my school on the weekends, because, you know, I had mats, right, so they could throw each other harder, mm -hmm. and then I participate, and they had like a patron, this Japanese, older Japanese gentleman who was like a college champ, like way back in the 60s or something. So I learned all the keiko, like the exercises from him and all that. And I've done them, you know, regularly, like the last 25 years. And then I met uh, uh, or I found the, uh, the guy who ran the USA Sumo Association probably eight years ago. And they train in L.A., right? So I would I would I started training and competing a little. And that's like super fun. So that was the last thing. So, you know, now mostly I teach uh, I teach Chinese styles or internal styles in privates and seminars. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, for the age of them, the head instructor at Jiu-Jitsu Academy. So I teach Jiu-Jitsu. Um, I coached some pro MMA fighters. I'm the grappling coach. And um, that's pretty much, you know, pretty much my, my, my gig now. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. So you probably don't know this. Um, the reason I started BJJ was because of you. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Um, so a friend of mine had your, he had your effortless throws hmm. and he had um, the ground proofing. Mm -hmm. And he showed them to me, and so I went ahead and bought them. And then 
because I, I knew there was a gap, like you said, with the with the arts that I was practicing. We would do takedowns, but then we would just let the guy back up. And I knew that that wasn't realistic. I'm like, there's more going on the ground. I wrestled a little bit myself. And so um, when I saw the ground proofing, I fell in love with like the technical stand up. I'm like, so that's still like one of my favorite moves um, to do because you can do sweeps with it. You can do so much with it. Yeah. And, and, and then when you came to the uh, seminar with Jeff Radcliffe and I did a private lesson with you and you showed me um, a guillotine um, kind of escape where you're you kind of chin out the person as you're escaping mm -hmm. and you showed me a couple other chin now because I wanted to work on chin now mm -hmm. and you showed me things that I was able to use right away and put into uh, practice immediately so I thought that was really cool yeah nice I think a lot of people you know shy away from jujitsu because they you know they're just unfamiliar and they're but I think a lot of people who do especially things like taiji you know when you're pushing hands and you're kind of they that kind of it's it's i mean you know you know from your background a lot of those it's not like you're going to do tight and be able to ground fight at all right mm -hmm. but it's the same almost kind of skill set with a sensitivity kind of structural alignment dominant art you know so i feel like a lot of people would really like to just so they just don't know it you know what I mean? you're exactly right yeah. yeah 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 they'd have fun if they try i mean it's hard work and all but it's if you find a, a good academy it's it's really a lot of fun it's a lot of fun to devote your life to it i mean one of the things about jiu-jitsu is the learning curve is really steep because you know i mean when it's new it always is but you can get real practical skills in months not years and then you know say you get to blue belt level and you never train again you get knocked down in a fight you know five years later you'll you'll win you know be in feel you know so that was my gr my ground proofing idea was just at least enough to understand how to escape and get up and all that mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's what kind of, like I said, started me. But then once I went and got deeper and deeper, just fell in love with the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, one of the things, too, that I really um, like is that there are some people, like um, some higher level people, who feel like what Tai Chi should feel like. I mean, when you go to push them or do anything to them, they kind of yield. And you actually wind up putting yourself into a position that they can take advantage of. And so... Yeah. I think those are the principles that a lot of the internal arts are supposed to uh, represent, like being able to yield and, and be soft and relax and just allow the other person to set his own death trap, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was. I remember being the first couple years I trained being frustrated because literally the, the teachers would use ex almost the exact same like verbiage as the Chinese teachers said, you know, I mean in English, obviously, but... And I would be, but I couldn't do it yet. You know what I mean? I was like, I know this stuff I've been doing, you know, stand up for years. You know, it just takes a while to get used to wrestling right on the ground. And then you start to get the certain point and yeah, it all feels, those kind of, I'm not going to say higher level, like the superior, but those arts that require a little bit like more sensitivity, understanding your own body positioning and framing and those things, right? Those, those I mean, there's, everybody's the same human, right? They're going to mm -hmm. come up with the same stuff that works. So yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. Plus, Jiu-Jitsu not only is it practical, um, it's fun, right? I mean, you know, when you wrestle, it's like sometimes you have a it's – a, it's a good ego check as well. You have a bad day, you know, or, or something, you know, somebody beats you. It's not personal, but you're like, man, you know, and you it, it's kind of – for me, it was – it's still to this day. I mean, even though I'm, you know, done it as long as I have, it's still like – and there's always new stuff too, which is a beautiful thing about – unlike things like judo where they keep taking things away or a lot of the traditional styles where – it's passed down. And if you don't do exactly what Grandmaster X did in the Qing dynasty, you know, you're like a heretic. Right. It's like, no, guys that invented martial arts, there would be no new martial arts if they weren't heretical, right? They learned a bunch of different stuff and made it, you know, so it doesn't mean make things up, but they have to be alive, right? So within the rules or within, you know, the parameters of what really works, you should be able to come up with new stuff. And that's what I think I really liked about the, the jiu-jitsu like they'll absorb whatever in and you know and it has to work because you're competing all it there's no fantasy kind of cool looking technique for its own sake right it's got to work for real yeah yeah I, yeah and i like the way you put that because i like to distinguish uh between what i call like um um basically techniques that are, are more um i i don't want i don't want to use the word fantasy but it was um that's a good word though yeah yeah it is a good word. So we'll stick with it for now until I can yeah. go think of the word that was in my head. But there's practical and then there's, you know, theoretical. That's the word I was looking yeah. for. So yeah. you see, yeah, you have so a lot of those theoretical videos. Um, yeah. But, but I, when you have to test everything is what I feel. Yeah. And, and so that's where we get the, the practicality. 
Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it live, like with some teachers where they're actually very good. I mean, they have real skills and they get a little older and they stop sparring with their students. You know, they're like masters now. They become once you become a master, you're always going to get worse because you can't train like you used to. I mean, now now you don't spar with your students that are better because, you know, you can never be submitted or thrown, you know, and you're you're for sure going to going to get worse. Now, I'm not talking about you're very old or something, you know, but a lot of guys fairly young. They open a school, they're a master, and then the students are very, um, what's the word now, like, you know, accommodating the, the teacher. You're not going to make the teacher look bad. So he starts to do things that kind of work on those guys, and they're kind of letting him do it. And then somehow in his head, he starts to believe it, you know, and then these techniques kind of bleed into the actual system. And when you look at him, you're like, no one in the history of the world's done that against a competent opponent. You know what I mean? That kind yeah. of thing. So I, th- I feel sometimes it's not, it's not uh, nobody's making stuff up. That, that doesn't work to fool anyone. It just kind of, you've got to be constantly testing it or say you're 80 and you come up with something, you got to teach it to one of your competitive students, to see if they can do it on people at their peers, right? Exactly. You can't make stuff up. So a lot of it's faith-based. These guys have never, ever tried it. And they just have faith. It's going to work in a life and death situation the first time, you know, that's yeah, scary. That's bad. Yeah. Not good. No. Yeah. So I do only have a few more minutes. I did have, um, couple questions that just for me I wanted to know like do you have a favorite technique or techniques that you like to do yeah I mean when I competed you know like when you, you learn everything but it, when you compete in any combat sport you you can't do everything right I mean so you're going to grab it's like most Olympic judo uh, gold medals have three throws they use their whole career you know they can set it up from anywhere and they get the rip on or whatever and you know boxers have a certain style you know depending on their size and all that so as a teacher, though, I try to keep up on anything new, you know, like in jujitsu or whatever, or, or like I watch, you know, I watch tape of people just to see maybe there's a better way to take a guy down off the cage. Or it's my job, right? So I keep up with it. And I try to teach things that I don't do a lot because you, it might work really well for you. You know what I mean? Like you're bigger mm-hmm. than me. So you might say, wow, this is a great guard pass. Whereas, you know, I don't like it, but uh, you might really like it. So as a teacher, I, I keep up on that. But personally, yeah, yeah. So in my competitive career, you know, I, I did get quite an, if we talk about um, like stand up arts from the Sanda all the way down, I threw uh, Uchimata, you know, mm-hmm. the inside I agree, was my biggest throw and I scored it a lot. So I, I learned it, I learned it originally in the Bagua, actually, that versions of it. Oh, wow. When I started doing Jiu Jitsu, and I had no idea how to grab the gi or anything, right? There was no, I'd never used the uniform before. So, Early on, I was, you know, guys that could really do judo, I had, I just couldn't keep up, right? They're just gripping and moving all over the place. So in jiu-jitsu schools, now there's almost no stand-up, a lot of them. But back then we did some stand-up, but not a lot of instruction. Like like the teacher, my teacher would, I actually had a black belt in judo. So he would give you like a rudimentary idea. And then you're supposed to be able to, you know. So I just started to figure out how to change the grips to ones that I knew already. Mm-hmm. And then when I got that done, I started to score a lot of throws. So uh, like, like uh, foot blocking, I, I got a lot. The Uchimata, um, hip tosses, and then um, as I went, you know, wrestled more. I like everyone. I single and double legged a lot. You know, those right, are the yeah. And then on the on the ground, um, I, t- I have long kind of. I'm kind of I'm flexible, more flexible than average. So I tend to triangle a lot. That kind of thing on my back. You know, I'm on my back, and I spend a lot of time on my pressure game because I'm smaller. I, I, you know, how in jujitsu they tell you if you're big, you use like. You got to use your strength. When you're small, you got to be fast. Mm-hmm. I found that not to work for me. So I would, I would, at my purple belt level, maybe four years of training when I did jujitsu, I would pass a really big, strong guy's guard and they would just lift me. You know, I was trying to be fast, but I, I never, so I just, I, I worked for years on closing all the space up. I, I got the idea originally from the internal, you know, in, in uh, my, my Chinese training and it's in jujitsu as well, but I had a, you know, I had a familiarity with it and I worked on, for my size, I feel like I have a, a heavy pressure game for being like 150 pounds. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's my overall, like not leaving space is my, I always have an idea that, and also because I train the MMA fighters, I have a big emphasis on not getting too sloppy with, you know, where the other guy's hands are. Cause we're just grappling, like always kind of understanding what he, he could kick me now. He could elbow me now. He could punch me now. Right. So I keep that in my game. Yeah. So, you know, so the, the things I, I, you know, I favor, I guess, as mm-hmm. so far on my own. Yeah. And, and I like the, um seeing your sparring footage on one of the videos i'm not sure which one it was but you guys had on uh some gloves and some some shin guards and so you were doing from standing to the ground very nice flow of uh, techniques between striking takedowns and then 
you know, either finishing or getting up with the technical stand up, making the space. So yeah, I can see that you you are aware of each position at each level and, you know, where you can be kicked, where you can be struck, things like that, which. Yeah, I pay attention. And you know what else? Well, one other thing I got the concept from the internal was when, because I was, I was in the training when MMA was kind of born, right? Back then I was just starting jujitsu and there's a, and they're much, much better now. I mean, these guys are the best fighters probably in history now, right? But there's still a lot of times when guys come to train a gap because they'll box, right? Like ring box. And then they wrestle and do jujitsu. And there's a gap between like the striking to the entry. So, you know, they'll set up a shot with strikes, but then it like, they just go full wrestling mode. <laughs> and one of the things they my teachers talked about constantly in internal was like, they would say in Chinese striking and grappling are the same move. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like sticking a little bit and it's not super fancy, but it would be like, you know, like I would parry your hand down and hit you. And that would go right into a neck clinch instead of hit, 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 stop, and then grab. Right. right. And I feel like that concept and a lot of the higher level level guys have, but back in the day, they, they really didn't. And I feel like that that's helped me a lot as well. So, you know, a lot of times, sometimes people ask me, they do kind of traditional martial arts or whatever. And, and then they, they come and spar with an MMA fighter and, you know, they, they just get worked. Right. And it's not useful. And it's like, no, you need more experience of the sparring. Right. Yeah. And it's not the techniques that work. Like they don't have the right, strategy or the right concepts but they're in, their, they're in their art though right they just they never learn to apply them though because they've never done it live so a lot of people if you if you're in a style you know if you go to spar and i'm saying sensible sparring you go to an mma academy or you know you go to spar you will you will very quickly become better at it with a lot of their traditional training once they understand like oh that's what my teacher meant or that's what the strategy means right mm -hmm. so you know, uh, there's a lot of, you know, very good concepts in all those ancient styles that, that, that carry over. Yeah. And, and the sparring too, it kind of helps you build up the distancing and timing of the things that you need, because when you're, if you're doing like a traditional art where you're doing a form, you know, you're pretty much almost stationary going from posture to posture, whereas you need to, you know, be able to accommodate what the other person is doing and kind of flow. Well, with I, their I say, yeah. Right. Sometimes people ask me like, about forms training because you know they forms get a really bad rap a lot of times in the modern world right like, oh you're dancing around it's like no 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 the, i told the couple things the people that invented those forms back in the day the real guys who invented these styles were actually fighting people and a lot of times for life and death they're not stupid they're not going to do anything that's not going to help them get better at fighting right so they were sparring they were conditioning but why were they also doing forms there was a reason and, and within their system they were doing them right so the idea is you know, what's the form for? If you think you can, so forms will, you know, help your alignment, balance, the technical movements you need, the strategy of the angles of application are buried in the, the way you do the form, right? Uh, you increase your mind-body unity, understand how to breathe, where you focus your vision, all those things. The thing they can't teach you to do is fight. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can't learn to fight though. So you're building attributes for fighting, then you have to fight, you have to spar, right? It, and I, the analogy I use is, if you and your clone went to a boxing gym and clone A, you know, hit hip mitts, tattooed a speed bag, hit the heavy bag, jumped rope, and he was great at it, and person B did all that, and then he sparred rounds every day, who's winning the real fight in the year? Right? right, yeah. So it's not that the other stuff's not important, it's just part of the whole system, yeah. So you have to go to the actual, if you want to be able to really fight or defend yourself, you have to approximate it with resistant live, you know, a resistant partner that with randomness who's sparring right that and there's different levels of it so sometimes too i say sparring and people picture i don't know thunderdome or something you know it's it's i start off a lot of my younger guys they start sparring the second week at a, at a certain level they're fine they don't get you know you get i mean it's a martial art you might get a little roughed up but you don't get hurt right, right. so any anytime it's non-cooperative there's an element of non-cooperativeness and randomness it's just it's sparring and then you work your way up right mm -hmm. and you have to know understand the levels of how to do it it's not like you do forms then you put a mouthpiece in and just start bare knuckle brawling that's not really so there's you know the way to work your way up so even free freestyle push hands is a kind of sparring yeah right? mm -hmm. it's the elements yeah so you, know, you work yourself up to to you know whatever whatever level of, of uh, ability you want to get yeah. but forms within those systems now the best fighters in the world now have never done a form you know what I mean? Most of the guys are in the UFC. So are they absolutely necessary? No, but they have a different system of training. Within your traditional system, they probably are necessary because mm -hmm. that's how it's set up, right? Yeah, if you want to be able to use it effectively. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I'm excited to, like I said, to, to have you come. And yeah. um, so 
we'll look at some maybe some Tai Chi, uh, look at some applications from that with you. But then maybe like one day we can work on the effortless throws mm -hmm. and some jujitsu concepts, whatever you want to teach. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, and then whatever else you can think of, you can kind of look at the group and say, you guys need this, right? So. Yeah, and you know, if they have, you know, any input from your group or whatever, you know, that I'm happy to, you know, whatever people want to go over, I'm happy to do it. It should be fun. Excellent, excellent. So I do have to hit the road. I'm glad you were uh, able to make the time to talk to me today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry I got back late, but... but that's all right, that's all right. And I look forward to talking to you soon. Okay, all right. All right. Thanks a lot, Tim. Take care. Yeah.